Welcome everyone again. Uh, you know, God has a great plan for all of us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Unfortunately, uh, most today are unaware of God's great plan. Most today just know of Satan's counterfeit of God's true plan. But Satan's counterfeit of God's true plan basically shows a weak and a haphazard plan, one that creates confusion. For example, with the counterfeit plan, what happens to children when they die? We're not sure. What happens to those who died before Christ's sacrifice for the remission of sin? People argue because they really don't know why or how this works. Attempting to explain all the issues that are created with this false belief, this counterfeit plan of salvation, indeed creates great confusion today. I'd like to begin today with an article that, well, it confused me a little bit. I think it's confused many people, especially Christians. I'd like to read an article from the Washington Times. This is by Cheryl K. Chumley, stated Friday, May 24, 2013. Quote, Pope Francis has sparked a religious debate with comments made earlier this week confirming atheists can indeed go to heaven. Christian teaching generally holds that belief in Jesus and not good deeds grants eternal life. But the Pope in a morning mass on Wednesday suggested that belief and faith weren't the biggest factors. He said, The Lord has redeemed all of us, all of us, with the blood of Christ, all of us, not just Catholics, everyone. Father, the atheists, even the atheists, everyone, we must meet another, meet one another doing good. But I don't believe, Father, I'm an atheist. But do good. We will meet one another there. Close quote. It would appear that the Pope is saying that we need to do good, to do good works to attain salvation. We need not have faith in Jesus Christ. We need not adopt his ways nor follow his commandments. In fact, we need not even know that Christ even exists. Of course, in Romans 3, verse 28, Paul tells us, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Or as a contemporary English version says, We see that people are acceptable to God because they have faith and not because they obey the law. Keeping, keeping God's law or its commandments and doing good works is a manifestation of us believing in Jesus Christ, in the ways of God that lead us to peace and happiness. But good works alone do not justify us. Good works alone do not save us. That's according to our Bibles. I'd like to read an additional article from The Independent, this is a new source in the UK. This can be found at independent.co.uk. It's written by Michael Day, and it was published on Wednesday, September 11th, 2013 again. The title, Pope Francis Assures Atheists You Don't Have to Believe in God to Go to Heaven. Again, quote, In comments likely to enhance his progressive reputation, Pope Francis has written a long, open letter to the founder of La Publica newspaper, Eugenio Scalfari, stating that non-believers would be forgiven by God if they followed their consciences. Responding to a list of questions published in the paper by Mr. Scalfari, who is not a Roman Catholic, Francis wrote, You ask me if the God of the Christians forgives those who don't believe and who don't seek the faith. I start by saying, and this is the fundamental thing, that God's mercy has no limits if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart. The issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. Sin, even for those who have no faith, exists when people disobey their conscience. Close quote. According to Mr. Scalfari, the Pope states that sin exists when people disobey their conscience. Do we sin when we disobey our conscience? If we are obey our conscience or conscience, can we never sin? 
Is that even the definition of sin? Well, according, of course, to 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is a transgression of the law. In other words, sin is the breaking of God's commandments. But if we're not aware of God's commandments, it would be fairly difficult to avoid breaking them. But according to what the Pope says, faith, even belief in Jesus Christ, is not necessary for our salvation. We should just listen to our conscience and do good works. That brings up some interesting questions, I believe, such as, is the conscience the same thing as the Holy Spirit? Can our conscience be relied on to teach us about right and wrong? Is God pleased if we just follow our conscience rather than actively seek Jesus Christ? So I'd like to take a look at our conscience today. That's something we haven't talked about. I probably need to state that I'm not a psychologist, although I did take a brief psychology course at the University of Kentucky. But is the Holy Spirit the same thing as our conscience? And if not, what might be the difference? I'd like to read from another article, this one from crosswalk.com, and it's titled, What is the Difference Between the Holy Spirit and My Conscience? This article is dated December 19th, 2019, a little more recent. Quote, Science and medical literature commonly define a conscience as the cognitive process that elicits emotion and rational associations based on an individual's moral philosophy or value system. Throughout generations of studies, theologians, scientists, and psychologists cannot agree whether or not these systems for a conscience are created early on in a person's life or even genetically passed on for generations. However we were made or raised, we all consider choices continuously. So, is our conscience guiding or the Holy Spirit? Conscience is largely determined by life experiences and influences. Here's a simple example, they say. I'm familiar with this. Generations of families ran moonshine in the hills of southeast Kentucky and northeast Tennessee. The clear intoxicant was the source of much economical gain for those families. People from outside and law enforcement clearly considered it wrong, as many were arrested. However, the families who grew up on the profits did not feel the venture as violating their own consciences because of the ingrained acceptance through the years. A conscience can become polluted. The Holy Spirit will always provide a clean conscience, but a clean conscience is not necessarily the product of the Holy Spirit. Thus, a person cannot judge his or her fellowship with Christ with the cleanliness of the conscience. Many liars, cheaters, and adulterers sleep quite well at night. Close quote. <clears throat> That's what they had to say. Well, yes, people can justify almost anything in their minds. Sometimes people might feel they're entitled to something. They might feel that they're justified in breaking God's commandments to get these things, whether they're aware of His commandments or not. But our conscience does not always reflect right and wrong, at least not right and wrong according to God. Sometimes we can actually sin, yet have a clear conscience. It's because we justify it in our minds. Our conscience is clear. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 17. That's Jeremiah chapter 17. Look at verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Our conscience, our feelings can't always be trusted. We see many people today operating based on their feelings. Now, I'm not questioning that these people are sincere about what they feel is right, but we simply can't trust our feelings or even our conscience to always teach us what is right. You know, perhaps Hitler or maybe some terrorist of our day, maybe they really believe that what they're doing is right. Maybe their culture or their religion actually taught them to do things that others might consider morally reprehensible. But they feel like it's the right thing to do. Their conscience is clear. We can't always go with what's in our hearts. Again, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Let's see what uh, we have here. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Wow. 
Heart here is the Hebrew word 3824 lab. It means feelings or the intellect, even one's understanding or wisdom. So our feelings, our understandings, what we believe to be right isn't always right. Often man's feelings and his understanding can be wrong, even desperately wicked, as we just read here in Jeremiah. No, we can't always trust our conscience. So can the conscience and the Holy Spirit be the same thing? Some people still ask that question. Uh, John 14, if you would. Let's turn to John chapter 14. It's John chapter 14 and verse 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. So here's some questions for you. Will the Holy Spirit ever teach us wrong? Will the Holy Spirit ever teach us to break God's commandments? Will the Holy Spirit teach us to murder, to lie, to covet, to follow other gods, or use God's name in vain? No, I, I don't think so. The Holy Spirit is from God. I believe the Holy Spirit will never teach us to do anything that's wrong. Now here in John we'll see that the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit teaches us, and I believe correctly, all things. Again, John 14, verse 26, Jesus is speaking here. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Now, the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father to teach us. And I believe that the Holy Spirit would never lead us astray, especially since he's sent by the Father. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was looking at my notes here. Titus uh, chapter 1. Let's go there next, if you would. Yeah, the Holy Spirit will never steer us wrong. Our conscience just might. Again, Titus chapter 1, verse 15. So if our conscience is not, not an always, <clears throat> excuse me, if our conscience is not always in agreement with what the Holy Spirit teaches us, then I'd say our conscience is certainly not the same thing as the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you agree? Okay. For example, would the Holy Spirit ever defile our minds and our conscience? Titus 1.15. And to the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, in other words, these are the unbelievers, is nothing pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. Reprobate meaning rejected or unapproved, according to Strong's. When people follow their conscience, they believe that what they're doing is right. At least, that's what their conscience tells them is right. It seems right to them, but we know in Proverbs 14, verse 12, I'm sure you're familiar with that, it says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You remember that? So, it may seem right to us. Our conscience may tell, tell us something. It may be right. It might not. John, if you would. John 14. Turn over to John chapter 14. And we'll go to verse 6 there. John chapter 14, verse 6. So according to Proverbs 14, verse 12, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, just following our conscience, doing what we feel is right, might end up with our death rather than eternal life. That wouldn't be good. But as we talked about it earlier, is it true? Can atheists just do good and enter into God's kingdom? Can they just follow their conscience? Well, I'd say not if their conscience has been defiled. But if our conscience isn't to be trusted to grant us eternal life, then what is? Again, John 14, verse 6. And here Thomas asked Jesus how we could come to be the Christ. Did Jesus tell us just follow our conscience and we would be in the kingdom? No. John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Okay. We know that we all must come to know Jesus Christ to enter into the kingdom of God. And just following our conscience or doing good works, well, that won't cut it. Of course, we might remember that Acts 4 verse 12 tells us that neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
easy to read, uh, the easy to read version puts it this way. Jesus is the only one who can save people. His name is the only power in the world that has been given to save anyone. We must be saved through him. Of course, what about those that never came to know Jesus Christ in this life? We know that one day all will come to know Christ. All will have God's Holy Spirit to teach them. But today, that's, that's not the case. Turn next few to Matthew chapter 7. It's Matthew chapter 7. We'll go to verse 7 as well. Matthew 7 and verse 7. It seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, it seems to me that really few today truly seek Jesus Christ. Most seem to be content just to believe whatever they're told about him. Often they never take the time to really study their Bibles to find out who Christ really is. And of course, if we're serious about getting to know the true God, obviously praying and asking him for wisdom and understanding would be a very good idea. But are we sure he'll answer us? Again, Matthew 7, verse 7. Here's what he says. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives. He that seeks finds. And he that knocks, it shall be opened. We need to ask. We need to pray. Verse 9. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, now basically we're still sinners, okay? If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? We need to ask. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would do that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now again, we just can't rely on our conscience to do this. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which may come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. We cannot always just trust our conscience. And we can't always just trust others to tell us the truth. But Jesus Christ and his disciples warned us over and over again about people who would lead us astray in some cases to make merchandise out of us. But what can happen if we rely solely on our conscience or even on other people to steer us right? What if we rely on our conscience or other people and not our Heavenly Father? Drop down to verse 21. That's Matthew 7, verse 21. What can happen to us if we don't follow Christ? Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, <coughs> but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now, those are words that we never want to hear from Jesus Christ. In doing good works, even wonderful works, as we just read, well, that doesn't save us. And that would seem to contradict what the leader of roughly half of the Christians in the world today is telling us. Jesus says in verse 21 that it's those that do the will of the Father that will be in the kingdom. But of course, if one doesn't even believe that God exists, I think it'd be impossible to do his will, making it impossible to enter the kingdom. Well, I think the major problem today we have is that few are actually willing to listen to God and study his holy Bible. Many seem to think that if they just follow their conscience or believe what, believe what others tell them about God, well, that's the way to develop a relationship with God and be in his kingdom. But what does Christ say in verse 24? Who are the wise and who are the foolish? Matthew 7 verse 24. 
Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, now Jesus is talking about his commandments here and those that do it, do them. Those who ever hear these sayings of mine and do them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Jesus says that those who, ha who have and keep his commandments are wise and are building a strong foundation. But what about those that don't keep his commandments? Perhaps those that rely on conscience or their leaders to tell us that we don't need to follow the commandments of God. Verse 26. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not, in other words, those who do not keep God's commandments, shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. When the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Those who have and keep God's commandments are building a strong foundation. But just doing good works or even mechanically keeping God's commandments, that doesn't grant us eternal life. We still must need to come to know Jesus Christ, to believe in Him, to trust Him. We need to develop a personal relationship with Him. Now, that's something many preach today, but then they proceed to tell us exactly what that relationship should be based on what they think. Very often in stark contrast to what our Bibles tell us. So how can we come to know Jesus Christ? Well, keeping his commandments teaches who he is and what he stands for. Let's just take the fourth commandment, for example. If we keep all God's Sabbaths, then we'll be keeping God's annual holy days that show us his plan of salvation. Or in turn over, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to get over there. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. But regarding God's holy days, how many today that do not keep God's holy days actually know about his true plan of salvation? Think about that. Before some of us knew of God's holy days, did we know about his actual plan of salvation? Well, God's plan shows us a loving, merciful God. Unlike the one that most believe in that likes to send people to hell, but we can learn about God and who He is by keeping His commandments. And if we don't keep God's commandments, can we truly say that we're coming to know Him as we were just told? Again, 1 John 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that says, I know Him, and keeps not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoso keeps His word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. When we come to keep God's commandments, we come to know God's character. We come to know who he is. But most today don't even know who God really is. Many believe that if they simply acknowledge that Jesus Christ exists, and ask for salvation, that's it. No repentance, and need to do nothing. But we need to keep the commandments. We need to walk as Jesus walked. He kept the commandments. He kept them perfectly. But before we can keep the commandments, we need to know what they are. Now, many might argue that following our conscience does always teach us right from wrong. Some will say that God has written his commandments on all our hearts and our minds. Maybe our conscience today. If people truly believe that God has written his laws, his commandments, on our hearts and on our minds, then what need would we have to teach others? I mean, why would missionaries be sent out to teach people about Christ if they already have God's commandments in their hearts and they're already coming to know him? There really should be no need for anyone to preach or teach to anyone else today if this is true, right? Jeremiah 31, if you would, Jeremiah 31 and chapter 31. I'm sorry, chapter 31 and verse 31. <laughs> Jeremiah 31, 31. So, has God written his commandments on our hearts and minds today? 
does everyone's conscience now contain the fourth commandment? I know most Christians ignore the Sabbath as if it didn't exist. So if God's commandments were written on their minds and their hearts, are all these Christians going against their conscience? Well, I suspect that most Christians are not truly convicted of God's fourth commandment and maybe a few others. And that would seem strange if all God's commandments had been written in our minds and our hearts. Now, the Bible does tell us this will happen. So I'm not saying it won't happen. I believe the question, though, is when? Since most today don't understand God's real plan, they believe that all prophecy must be fulfilled now, or at least by the time of Jesus' return. Therefore, most are completely unaware of the thousand-year period after Christ's return, or the period after that known as the last great day. There is much Bible prophecy that will be fulfilled after Christ returns. Bible prophecy will continue to be fulfilled for over a thousand years after the return of Jesus Christ. So again, Jeremiah 31, verse 31. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come. Now this is a future event that's being spoken of here. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice that. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which was my covenant they broke, although I was a husband of them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Well, after what days? What time period is God speaking of? Didn't really say, did it? But notice carefully the rest of this verse. Here's what he says. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it into their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. When God writes his laws into the hearts and minds of the people, then he will be our God and we will be his people. At that time, there will be no need for preachers or teachers like there is today. They won't be needed because the people will already know. We can see that clearly in the next verse, verse 34. And they shall teach no more, every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. They shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, I'll remember their sin no more. So, when will the house of Israel finally be God's people? And when will God himself actually become their God? When does it happen? Revelation 21, if you would. Uh, uh, Revelation 21, that's chapter 21 and verse 1. We'll start at the beginning. Now think about this. Today, does the entire house of Israel truly know God? No. Is the true God really their God today, or, or are they even truly his people at this point? No. Not today, not yet. So my question is, when will God truly be their God and they be his people? When does this occur? Again, Revelation 21, verse 1. Now, what time period is being spoken of here in Revelation? See if we can tell. Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, obviously, we've not seen the new heaven and the new earth yet. This is definitely in the future. I think everybody realizes that. But when will the current heaven and earth pass away? When will we see the new heaven and the new earth? When will we see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven? When is that? Does anybody know? That's during God's last great day. And that's over a thousand years from now. We know that. But what else happens then at that time? Verse 3. Heard a, <coughs> heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and, look closely here, 
they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Finally, as God's great plan for the salvation of mankind comes to a close, at last we'll become his people and he will be our God. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, obviously, this occurs at the last day. It's not happened yet. We're not even close to seeing this today. We've got a way to go yet. But God will place his laws, his commandments in our minds and our hearts. This will be done at the end of God's true plan of salvation for mankind, not today. Verse 5. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. And I'll stop there. Revelation chapter 21 describes the end of God's plan for the salvation of mankind. This is when God's great plan for us reaches its completion. It is finished. It is done. And we see people talking today about the Gog-Magog war that's about to break out any day now. I've talked about that in the past. But that too will occur in the last day, over a thousand years from now. But many mistakenly think it will occur very soon because, again, they believe that all prophecy must be fulfilled by the return of Jesus Christ. To them, there will be no thousand-year reign of Christ followed by God's last great day. Understanding how most Christians think and what they believe, I can certainly see why so many believe that God has written His commandments on everyone's hearts and minds today. After all, if He didn't, when would He? That doesn't make sense as we discussed earlier. We still need to teach everyone at this point, or they need to be taught or need to study. But when we come to understand the true plan of God, then all of this comes together and begins to make a lot of sense. Hebrews 8 Hebrews chapter 8, if you would. We have several scriptures today. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7. We'll also see in the New Testament the writing of God's laws, His commandments on our hearts, and see that it is a future event. Let's look at this account in Hebrews. Again, that's Hebrews 8 verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice both. Now, we won't have time today, but if you look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 17, that's Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 17, and the surrounding verses, you'll see where God makes a covenant with both Israel and Judah. He calls them each a stick and joins them together in one hand. If you look at the preceding verses, we'll see the resurrections of the last great day. And again, this leads us to the conclusion that it is not yet time for God to write His commandments in our hearts just yet. I want to check that out. Again, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37 for that when you get time. Let's go on down to verse 9, Hebrews 8 verse 9 for now. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because it continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Again, we see the exact same thing here in Hebrews that we basically saw in Jeremiah chapter 31. Continuing. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. This is the time of God's last great day, but not today. Verse 11, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest, because then God's laws will be written to every person's mind and to every person's heart. We might say to their conscience. I'm not sure if that's actually technically accurate or not, but you get the idea. The main thing is that all will know the Lord. Unlike today, during God's last great day, 
will no longer be teaching our friends, our relatives, and our neighbors about God and His ways because it'll already be there. But this, of course, is in our future. Well, you might ask, what about a Christ's return? What about then? Well, at Christ's return, those that are redeemed from the earth and the first resurrection will be kings and priests ruling over those who survive into the great tribulation, uh, who survive the great tribulation, right? Okay, so the people in the first resurrection will be kings and priests ruling over those who survive the great survive the great tribulation, and they'll be teaching them about God, right? That's what their job is to be. So obviously, the people are still teaching others about God's ways, and God's laws are not yet written upon their hearts and minds. And of course, we just saw that this doesn't happen until the last great day, so this is all consistent. This all makes sense. But there's only one other account of this in the Bible. I think it's in Hebrews. I'll just read it to you. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. I'll read these two verses, but if you want to look at them later, it's uh, chapter, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Again, I believe this is describing the last great day. And at that time, in God's last great day, mankind will have witnessed the ways of man, aided by Satan, for thousands of years. The millennium will show us what things can be like by following the ways of God as Jesus Christ and his saints rule during those thousand years as they rule and teach others. And after all that, I believe that most will welcome God's ways and His laws that teach us how to truly love one another and to finally live in peace with each other. And then, at last, all in God's kingdom will truly have God's laws written upon their minds and in their hearts. All in God's kingdom will live for eternity in peace and harmony and with great love for each other. What an incredibly awesome plan God has for us. It's just so much greater than most can understand today. But let's come back to today. I've gotten off track, I think. Well, the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as our conscience. Our conscience can often let us know when we do something wrong, or hopefully before we do it, but our conscience today is not the same as God's Holy Spirit. We can't rely totally on our conscience to always convict us of what is right. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit will always teach us right. The Holy Spirit will always be in agreement with God and His commandments for us. Now at this point, how do we know if our human conscience is telling us the truth or maybe it's the Holy Spirit? Which is it that tells us something maybe? 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, starting verse 1. So at this point, how do we know if it's our conscience speaking to us or if it's the Holy Spirit? I think some of us over time can le kind of learn the difference, but uh, I think the idea here is that if it's something that glorifies God and is consistent with the fruits of the Spirit, then it's likely from the Holy Spirit. We'll read some about the fruits in a few minutes. If it glorifies man, then it probably isn't. Again, 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Now, the word here is the Greek pneuma, it doesn't necessarily mean a spirit being, but rather an entity, or possibly even a thought. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist whereof you've heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. This was happening in Jesus' time. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Hereby we know the spirit of truth 
and the spirit of error. So who is it that knows God, as we just read here in verse 4? Well, according to 1 John chapter 2, as we read, it's those who keep his commandments. It is they that will know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we'll begin in verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Those who are not of the world, but of God, can discern truth. They can usually tell right from wrong. Not because of the conscience they had in the past that tells them. They've become convicted by the knowledge of God's commandments that teach us righteousness, and of course, by the Holy Spirit. So, we need to replace our carnal conscience with the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God. Our human conscience will often lead us to conform to the world as we see so many Christians doing today. We have to be careful. We can't trust our conscience. We need God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need His Word and His commandments. Again, Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I might add, the renewing of our conscience, you might say. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Remember we said earlier that those who do the will of God will be those that will be in the kingdom. We need to follow Christ and his commandments and not always our conscience, which often tends to conform to the world. We've got to be careful about that, but let's keep going. First Timothy, if you would. First Timothy chapter 4, and we'll be in verse 1 again. First Timothy chapter 4. I believe what we're talking about today may be more important than ever, as more and more people seem to be abandoning the faith today. Don't we see that? Even many Christian denominations out there seem to be leaning toward the world. They're not standing firm with Christ. They're compromising and they're moving away. We really, really need to listen to the Holy Spirit today and watch out for the deception of our conscience. Why do I say this? 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We find that many today are indeed stuck with the doctrines of devils. Their conscience has been seared with a hot iron, if you will. They're locked in. They're unable to change. Brethren, we need to always be on guard so this will never happen to us. To conclude, humans today have something called a conscience. It generally does a pretty good job of convicting us to do what's right. It generally does. It's not a bad thing. But the human conscience is not perfect. We can't always count on it to tell us to do the right thing. We saw earlier that moonshiners in Kentucky and Tennessee, they all truly believed they were doing what was right. They were following their conscience to take care of their families. Their conscience was clear. This is likely because their culture taught them this. Meanwhile, others believed their conscience told them that this was wrong. As we read in the article, a conscience can become polluted. And people can justify about anything if, they, if it gets them what they want. And often they can still have a clear conscience if they justify it to themselves. We just can't trust our conscience, our hearts, our feelings. Jeremiah said, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Titus chapter 1, we saw that the conscience can be defiled or corrupted. What seems right to us, based on our conscience, might appear to be the right thing to do, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Can atheists join God in his great kingdom? Well, according to our Bibles, no. At least it's not as long as they're still atheists. It doesn't matter if they follow their conscience and or do good works. 
they still must come to believe in Jesus Christ. There are no exceptions. But we know that one day, they will know God. They will know Jesus Christ, along with everyone else. So it's coming, just not there yet. We know that all will have the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ and to be with him and us in his kingdom. So all is not lost. But we know from Matthew chapter 7 that many of us might do many good works as we follow our conscience. Yet Christ, Christ might say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Everyone must come to know Jesus Christ to be saved. There are no exceptions anywhere. People make them up all the time, but they're not there. The only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. Today, we need to follow God's instructions, His commandments that teach us who He truly is. One day, all will come to know God and have His laws written in their minds and in their hearts. But that day will be in the future. Today, we have many important lessons to learn before that last day. We have many things yet to learn so that as many as possible will come to repentance and enter God's kingdom. After all, God is not willing that any should perish, even if it takes great trials and tribulation to accomplish that goal. God loves us that much, and He is very patient with us. It isn't over yet. It isn't close to being over. I'd like to end today with some advice from the Apostle Paul. So if you would turn over to Galatians chapter 5, I think this is our last scripture. I think so. That's Galatians chapter 5. We'll start in verse 16. We'll be reading verses 16 through 25. Again, that's Galatians 5 verse 16 to end today. So here's some good advice from Paul, I think, to send us off. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. We're seeing some of this today, aren't we? And, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now here come the fruits I was talking about earlier. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such things. There is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So let's not live by what our conscience says. Let's not live by what our hearts or our feelings sometimes tell us. Let's live by the Word of God, by His commandments, and with the guidance of His Holy Spirit, as we look to join Jesus Christ, the Father, and all our brothers and sisters in the great soon-coming kingdom of God.